Hello, everybody. So I think we will start. The time is actually two o'clock now. Before I just get started, I would just like to hear if you can hear me. And if you can hear me, please write yes in the chat area. That's perfect. I think there's at least some of you that can hear me. Okay, but uh, yes, welcome to this webinar about diffuse ceiling supply. Uh, my name is Yannick Roth, and I work for from Wintermaster. And here with me with today is uh, Professor Per Heiselberg from Aalborg University, who will give you a lecture in diffuse ceiling and also their findings. Uh, but before we start, I have some practical information. So sound okay? I think you all of you have ruled it yes, so that's good. Uh, and of course, uh, we will have question during the session. So if you have a question, you can raise these uh, in the chat area, and we will try to follow up on, on these. Otherwise, we'll also have a Q&A session in the end of this uh, presentation. Yes, but the webinar is scheduled for around uh, one hour, approximately, plus or minus. Yes, so here's actually the agenda is quite easy. Um, first of all, uh, Pierre Heisenberg would like to tell you about, more about the uh, diffuse ceiling supply. And hereafter, I will give you some insight in some case studies we have found and we have investigated as well. And of course, lastly, we have this Q&A session. So I will give you the word to Pierre Heisenberg, and I'm pleased and delighted that he could join us here today and give us some more information about diffuse ceiling supply. So it's all yours, Pierre. Thank you, Yannick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will try to give you a short introduction to the uh, concept of diffuse ceiling supply, and uh, give you some information about uh, the, the results of some of the investigations we have done. And then, as Yannick said, he will then afterwards give some more examples on uh, applications. Uh, the background for uh, going into this work of looking into the view ceiling supply is um, there is a number of issues. First of all, we see an increased need for cooling in these years in our buildings uh, because uh, we improve their performance by better insulation, air tightness and so on. So especially in offices and educational buildings, there is always a cool, cooling need during occupied hours. And you could say cooling is not a te new technology. We have been using cooling for, for, for many years. But I think we all face the challenge to uh, achieve you could say, high performance buildings that we have to look for more efficient systems, you could say, in all, uh, in all areas, also in the, in the cooling area. Um, if we look at, at mechanical systems, um, we have for many years, uh, especially in the in the middle and north European climate, used the, the free cooling potential of the outdoor air. Most of the year, uh, the outdoor air temperature is uh, beneficial for, for cooling of our buildings and we can use it uh, directly. However, uh, if we look at, at mechanical systems, um, usually uh, we have we have a limitations on how low temperatures we can uh, supply to the spaces. So this means that although we have a very low outdoor temperature, we maybe have to increase the supply temperature to maybe 18, uh, 19 degrees uh, to avoid uh, the draft risk. So this means that uh, we typically have quite high airflow rates for, for supplying the enough cooling, maybe four or five air changes per hour. While if we could use the cooling potential of the outdoor air directly, we could reduce the air change rate maybe to one, two air changes per hour or, or very similar to the air change we need for indoor air quality purposes. So this increase in flow rate both uh, results in an increase in the, in the ventilation systems, but it also increases or it also gives an increase in the energy use. If we look at natural ventilation, uh, this is often not used in the cold season because it's difficult to supply to the space without uh, creating draft from, from very cold outdoor air. So this is often another used for cooling purposes in the, in the winter or the cold uh, season. Uh, and we have looked into diffusing your su uh, supply because um, by this technology we can provide very low 
temperature supply air without uh, creating draft in the space. So we can save a lot of electric, uh, electric energy for transportation of air in mechanical systems and we can make it possible to use natural ventilation even in the cold uh, season. So this was a little bit about the background. I will now show you some results uh, from uh, an international project that we have been uh, involved in uh, just to illustrate the, the challenges with, uh, you could say, um, having the cooling with the outdoor air in mechanical systems. And, and the results I will show you is, is based on some predictions on, a, um, on a, 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 a typical meeting room uh, on, a, on a test case in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, th this figure shows, um, you could say, five different cases. One is a, a reference case for this building or for this space. Uh, what is the, the cooling need uh, or the electricity consumption to provide the, the, the cooling need to the, to the space? And then there are four different uh, other options. One where Natural ventilation is uh, used during the occupied uh, period. Uh, one where natural ventilation is utilized 24 hours uh, if, if necessary. And then there are two options for the mechanical ventilation. One where uh, the mechanical ventilation is used not only during occupied hours, but actually also six, six hours uh, during the night. And the last option is where we have mechanical ventilation uh, whenever the uh, outdoor temperature is more than four degrees uh, below the indoor temperature. And um, uh, the, the, the results on the figure shows what, you could say how much the, the cooling need is reduced by applying uh, these uh, strategies. Uh, and, and you can see that for natural ventilation, uh, it seems that the ventilation cooling benefit is larger. And this is, of course, because we have the possibility to provide larger flow rates, while in the mechanical situation we are limited to the to the capacity of the of the system. But which is maybe more even more problematic is that that you could see the the bread bars is the electricity consumption for transportation of air. So this means that even though we we, we can reduce the cooling need. Uh, a lot of this savings uh, is actually used by used for electricity for the fans. So this means that we have to be very careful when we use uh, outdoor air for free cooling in mechanical systems that we don't um, lose the benefit by having a too high electricity consumption for fans. The next here shows uh, ah this is actually the same. I'm sorry I should not have taken this figure. This was the figure I would like to show, because if if we look at uh, at what is important for using uh, mechanical ventilation uh, for for uh, for cooling is of course what is the electricity consumption of the of the fan. So uh, you could say the the lower the outdoor temperature, uh, the the better the cooling system SER is the is the seasonal energy efficiency rate. So so the the higher the uh, or the lower the outdoor temperature are, the, the the more efficient is the cooling system. And then on the on the vertical axis we have the specific uh, fan power input for, for for the ventilation system. And then here is is an example which is made for Boston in the U.S. and uh, showing where is the limit uh, between you could say the the efficiency of the cooling system and the specific fan power we use. Uh, if we are below the limit, uh, it's uh, favorable to use mechanical ventilation and the free cooling of outdoor air. And if we are above, our electricity consumption is too high. And, and two examples are shown in the tables uh, beside. Uh, one with an SPI or C, uh, in, in, uh, specific power input for the fan on 0.4 watts per, cu per cubic meter per hour. And the lower one is at 1.5 watts per cubic meter per hour. And what you can see is that if the fan, if the input for the fan is too high, we actually do not get an advantage of, uh, of utilizing the cold air. We, the, our consumption in the end uh, turns out to be higher. So this means that we have to be very careful. And if we can use the, the uh, you could say, the direct, uh, uh, the air, even at low temperatures, uh, for, 
we can reduce the flow rates and thereby we can of course reduce the, the red bars uh, which is the electricity consumption for the fans. Uh, now I would like to say something about uh, the principles about diffuse sealing um, uh, ventilation. Um, the, the idea is that we use the suspended ceiling as the uh, air terminal for, for supplying the air. Uh, so we create a plenum uh, above the suspended ceiling where we uh, uh, supply uh, the air and it's then transported from the plenum uh, to, the, to the space. We can uh, have uh, different types of suspended ceiling. Uh, here uh, is just shown three different types of suspended ceiling. Um, where, where the first one is, is a, a ceiling where the where the plates in the suspended ceiling are, are permeable to, to the air. So we have an air supply both through the uh, ceiling plates as well as through the uh, mounting system in the ceiling. Uh, the, the middle solution there we have plates which are not penetrable to, to air. So there the air su is supplied to the space only in through the gaps, air gaps in the in the mounting system. And the last uh, example is a, is a diffuse ceiling where uh, you could say the whole ceiling is diffuse and we don't have any, um, you could say, visible mounting on the, on the diffuse uh, ceiling air panels. Um, this figure shows, you could say, one of the advantages of using uh, diffuse ceiling panels is that we have a, typically a very low pressure loss in this uh, air supply. Uh, and, and the figure shows uh, different types. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, the wood cement panels, as you see here. Here you can see the, what is the, the pressure drop as a function of the, the flow rate. And you can see we typically have pressure drops which are in the range of uh, just, uh, just a very few pascal. Uh, in the case of, um, uh, of uh, yes, yeah, so up here you actually see an example of a fully diffuse ceiling where, where you can see that the pressure drop is actually much higher than, than for these uh, panels, uh, uh, a type where, where the pressure drop is in the range of maybe 50 to, to 100 pascal. So there are uh, different types of, of, of solutions which are different uh, uh, I would say uh, pressure losses. Uh, I will now the, the uh, you could say the starting point for our work in this area is that we for many years have uh, compared the performance of different air distribution systems to provide fresh air and uh, cooling uh, to uh, to spaces, and um, this we have done in order to compare the performance of these different systems. and And this figure here shows. Uh, for different types of air supply to a space, um, uh, you could say the, at the at the lower axis we have the airflow rate supplied to the space, and and uh, at the vertical axis we have the temperature difference between the supply air and the room air, and and then we have different curves showing where, where we have comfortable areas and where we have you could say either too high flow rate or too high temperature difference, and we will create discomfort in the room. And for example, this curve here uh, shows for a mixing ventilation unit that, that, that if you are on the left side and below this curve, it's comfortable. And if you are in this area, it's uncomfortable. And, and you can see different uh, solutions. And up here, you have the diffuse ceiling inlet. Uh, and, and as you can see here, this actually can provide both quite air, high airflow rates and quite high temperature differences. So this means it has a, a high cooling capacity, but it's also very flexible on, uh, it can provide uh, comfort both at, at small airflow rates and high temperature differences and, and high flow rates and small temperature differences. So it's actually a quite flexible supply and can also uh, give a high uh, cooling capacity. So this was the reason why we started, a, you could say, a larger uh, investigation on this uh, type of uh, inlet. You can use a diffuse ceiling supply uh, in combination with with many uh, with different ventilation systems. Uh, you can because it has so low a pressure drop, 
you can you can use it as supply for for natural ventilation uh, and of course you can also use uh, 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 mechanical ventilation for for air supply or even a full air conditioning system where you use the ceiling for for air supply um, or it can be a hybrid system so where you maybe have have a, a mechanical exhaust and you have a local fan coil unit for heating and cooling. So there are, are, are many possibilities to apply this uh, air supply uh, technology. All the results of the activities during the last years have been summarized in a in a design guide for for diffuse ceiling ventilation, and you can uh, you can uh, get this um, design guide on this um, uh, on this uh, website. Uh, and I will now uh, show you some of the results from from the lab, which which has uh, you could say given the the information that is provided in the guide, and and Yannick will later talk about the the, the case studies. Uh, mo most of this work has been carried out in a in a in a in a test space which has the same size and as an, an office room, and where it has been mounted a diffuse ceiling and then been simulated an an office uh, environment. And of course, there has been a lot of uh, um, um, measurement uh, points in the uh, in, in in the room to to check the the comfort conditions. And then there has been uh, carried out a, a number of design cases. Uh, first of all, with with different uh, internal uh, heat loads. Uh, uh, different airflow rates and and different you could say outdoor temperature conditions. So to simulate both a very severe winter but also a very warm uh, periods. Uh, here are some of the results of these investigations and and one of the the, the very important result is that if you look at the temperature gradient in these spaces, then the temperature distribution is very even in spaces with diffuse ceiling supply. So we have the same temperature, you could say, from, from floor to, to ceiling. We have done some tests where we have used it also for heating, and, and you can see these two curves is the situation of the temperature gradient if we use it for heating. Uh, then we of course have higher temperatures at the ceiling and lower temperatures at the floor, but the, the, the temperature gradients are still below, you could say, what is acceptable for uh, comfort. Uh, this uh, shows some experiments on the, on the draft risk. So is it a comparison with the case without diffuse ceiling, uh, with the case with diffuse ceiling? Um, and here we have an extreme low uh, supply air temperature of uh, minus 8 degree and, uh, degrees and an air change rate of 4 air changes. And um, uh, you can see that, the, uh, that if we don't have the diffuse air ceiling, we have, have a relatively high draft rates uh, close to the, to the inlet. Uh, while in the case with diffuse ceiling, we have a much lower uh, draft rates and, and which are well below the requirements in the in the standards. The same case, you could see we have very high supply air temperatures. Um, in this case, we have uh, the, the air will, will circulate differently in the room and the, and the areas with the highest draft risk will in the, be in the back of the room. And still you can see there's a big difference between using the, the diffuse ceiling supply. It reduces the the, the draft risk uh, considerably. Uh, you will also find in the design guide uh, different results uh, showing uh, how the performance is for different con from configurations of ceilings. And this this figure here shows this design chart where you where where what is below and left of the points are comfortable conditions and what is above and and to the right of the points are, are uncomfortable conditions. Uh, 
and you can see the flow rate uh, as, as a function of the temperature difference of the inlet air. And uh, you can see here three different configurations. One where we have a supply of air through the whole ceiling. So 50% of the ceiling is, is penetrable to, to ventilation air. And the lower one, it's only 18% of the ceiling where we have supply of air. However, if you if you look at the at the results, uh, uh, it seems that that the capacity of the system is not that uh, you could say sensitive to um, the the configuration of the ceiling. And if we use the whole ceiling or only part of the ceiling for uh, for for air supply, um, and you you can see that we can actually depending on the airflow rate, we can we can supply air temperature. Uh, with a difference of up to 25 degrees without creating uh, discomfort uh, in the in the space. What happens when we use diff diffuse ceiling air? So you could say in the traditional mechanical system or our displacement ventilation system, we are used to that it is the as the air terminal that uh, determines the the flow conditions in the space, and it's the the layout of the air supply, and 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 the device that determines uh, the, the the draft risk. In in diffuse ceiling supply, the supply air velocity is very very low, and this means that it's actually not the uh, ventilation system that determines the air distribution in the space and the velocity level, but it's more the heat sources that we have in the space that determines the, the velocity level. So therefore, the flow conditions, and, and the figure here shows um, uh, uh, some predictions uh, by computational fluid dynamics on how the, the velocity uh, distribution and the velocity level will change depending on the location of, of uh, heat sources. Uh, and you can see it's it's very much affected of the uh, of the uh, of the location of the heat sources, how the circulation of air is in the space, and what is the velocity levels in different uh, areas. Uh, however, if you if you look at the you could say the draft rate. You could see here is the draft rate shown as a function of distance from the inlet. So this is along the length of the space. And of course, depending on where the uh, heat sources are located, the draft rate will be higher in some areas. For example, if, if, if the heat sources are located in the front side of the room, the draft rate will be highest in the back side and the opposite. So you could say the draft rate will be highest where the heat sources are not located. Uh, but anyway, you could say all these values are, are reasonable, uh, are, are, you could say, acceptable, although they, they change. Uh, as it is the, the convective flows from the heat sources that determines the, the, the velocity uh, levels and the air distribution, actually the height of the room has, has an important uh, uh, as or important uh, influence on the conditions, because the 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 higher the room height we have, the more uh, power the the convective heat uh, uh, above the heat sources can can get. So this means that the velocity level increases with uh, room height. So therefore, this system with diffuse ceiling supply. If, uh, if you have a low uh, uh, room height, it has a, a higher capacity than if you have a large room height. Then, then the capacity is lower because we, we cannot accept to have too high heat sources in the space because they will create too high velocities. Uh, and this is also illustrated here uh, with how the draft risk or draft rate actually increases with room height, although uh, we have the same, in this case, the same level of heat sources in the, in the space. So for, for the conclusion on this, uh, and, and this is not just conclusions based on this presentation, but this is actually the conclusions uh, made in the, in the design guide, uh, that uh, the fuel ceiling supply can, can provide a lot 
low draft risk in the occupied zone, even if we uh, supply air at very low air temperatures. Uh, air distribution and draft risk is depend is, is not dependent on the we could say so much on the way we we supply the air to the space, but it it's more uh, depending on uh, on the location of the heat loads, uh, the the height of the um, and the and the height of the uh, uh, ceiling. Uh, we have very low temperature gradients in rooms, so the diffuse ceiling supply. Uh, and and it it's also that in, in especially in the case where you use uh, diffuse ceilings which have a certain insulation level, uh, we, um, uh, we we do not have any uh, radiant temperature symmetry uh, challenges. We have a very low pressure drop uh, in almost all, always below at least five pascal. Uh, something that I have not spent so much time on discussing is what should be the requirements for the design of the of the plenum. Um, there is more about this in the in the design guide, but uh, usually we say that if you have a low uh, plenum height which is minimum 20 centimeters, then this is enough to ensure uh, an even air distribution at at normal uh, room sizes. So actually, it, it can work at quite low uh, plenum heights. Uh, yes, just uh, by the end, um, the, the link to the website where you can download the design guide for diffuse ceiling uh, ventilation. Uh, I can see that you have had a number of questions and I have not been able to, you could say, manage uh, to, to answer them in the same time, but I, I guess we will do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and uh, thanks for a nice overview of this study you have made during the last couple of years. And uh, I can see that many of you write questions as well. Uh, and I think, as Pierre said, we can take these uh, in the end of the, of the presentation as well. So I will just continue uh, with the case studies that we have been investigated as well, and just some of them which can perhaps be some inspiration to you all. So uh, as Pierre mentioned, there are two examples in the design uh, guide. They have been looking at uh, one classroom and uh, one office room as well. Uh, the classroom is made with mechanical insulation solution and the office room is made, uh, you can say, a, a hybrid solution. Uh, I don't want to go into details uh, with these two examples, as all the text and all the explanation can be found in this design guideline. So therefore, I would like to focus more on some real case studies, just to give you some examples and some ideas where these, where this technology, technology can be applied. So there's different schools. It's one of the main uh, focus area, especially here in Denmark, uh, due to we have many old schools with not so good ventilation. So of course the primary aim here is of course to improve the indoor air quality in these school buildings. So if we just go on, the first school I would like to to show to you is uh, actually one located here in Denmark. It was actually designed before we. Uh, we made this study, so it was designed in 2009. Uh, okay, we, it was designed in 2009, and, and actually, well, some of peer study students have made their master thesis about actually this school. So we have a lot of measurements from that school I want to show you. Um, so actually, here is the ventilation principle, as you can see here, <coughs> uh, to your left-hand side picture is actually, you can see a cross-section of the classroom. So you have the plenum on top of the room. Then, of course, you have the room. On the outside view, you can actually see here, just get this green thing. You can see these grills. So this is actually the inlet for the, for the diffuse ceiling supply. So if we go to a little bit more uh, detailed uh, view here of the diffuse ceiling, so 
mm. the diffuse ceiling as you have it here. But if we take a closer look into it, we can actually see that the height of the diffuse ceiling is approximately 200 um, millimeters, which, which is also in the range of what uh, Pierre was suggesting. However, you can see here there are some uh, some uh, this is a beam here, which is actually making it a little bit harder for the Flow to enter this uh, diffuse this plenum area, so you can see actually here we only have a distance of uh, 6.5 centimeters, so that's not so much. So here, <clears throat> in here you can see here the inter external grills, and here actually we also have a, a damper which can be controlled. Actually, okay. So if we go next to the next slide here, so here we have a configuration of the diffuse ceiling. So this is what is marked here with these hatches. So we have approximately 15% of the area is actually the diffuse ceiling area or inlets. We also have artificial lighting. This is this cross here. And also in the back of the room, we have the exhaust located in the Occupy area. So it means that it's located in the room itself and not in the we have around uh, yeah, a normal kind of classroom with 26 students, and it's around 60 square meters. And the exhaust capacity of that is around 750 cubic meter per hour. And actually, every time when the students or teachers open the manual overall windows, the exhaust will then turn off. So now we're going to the more uh, detailed results here. So this is actually one Friday here. Uh, you can see the outdoor temperature is around uh, from varying from five to eight degrees Celsius. So what is illustrated here is actually the blue curve here it shows the uh, inlet of the facade and the temperature here we have the orange curve here shows the exhaust temperatures and actually all the other lines here are measurements done in the room at different heights. Uh, so you can see here it's quite stable throughout this day, throughout the period, uh, with diffuse ceiling supply. The gray area here shows when the occupy or when the people open and close the manual overall windows meaning that the diffuse seating supply is actually not functioning or they have been chosen to shut down the exhaust throughout this period of time. And here is actually the same picture. So this is just measurements, temperature measurements uh, done there uh, underneath the tin diffuse seating uh, panels. So here you can actually see one of the measurements. So here we have one of the diffuse ceiling panels, and here we actually have a, uh, yeah, just how the measurement is carried out. So it's underneath the panels, so inside the space. So actually, you can also see here during the daytime, uh, it's quite stable temperatures, and of course, one improvement could have been here in this case could have been also to measure the temperature in the plane on, on the other side of the diffuse ceiling panels as well. But again, it shows a very stable uh, temperature throughout the day. Another one I saw, one of uh, the questions that was uh, raised was about how we uh, determine this risk of draft. So of course, one parameter is, of course, to measure the actual uh, air velocities inside the room. Firstly, the, the green area, uh, the green curve here shows actually the turbulence intensity. I'll get back to that a little bit. Later. It can be read off by the axis over here. Okay, and then we also have, <coughs> let's say here, then we also have uh, air velocity measurements inside the room. You can see these are quite low. These are around 0 0.1 meters per second uh, at all time. Of course, we have some uh, measurements in, in this area where they are up to 
uh, 0.15 meters per second, but this can also be due to the people walking around and so on. Uh, and as you see here, the gray area indicates when the people open and close the windows in the occupied in the occupied zone, and this will of course increase the air velocity inside the space. If we go a little bit further, we can also look at something uh, called draft rate. So actually, the draft rate is a formula which combines the local air temperature, the mean air velocity temperature, and the turbulence uh, intensity as well. So Looking at these uh, fluctuating graphs and curves over here, uh, you can actually see that the draft rate is uh, almost always below uh, 10%. And if we look at some different guidelines and categories here, we can see that a Category 1 building should have a draft rate uh, of around below 10%. So this is actually fulfilled uh, most of the time here. a little bit further. So <clears throat> there was also measurements uh, done here to see how effective is this ventilation strategy actually. So here is measurements showing the ventilation effectiveness. So one meaning, one indicates that it's fully mixed and we can see that most of the time the values is at least one or above one, meaning that this is a fully mixed ventilation solution inside the classroom as well. So what we have learned is, of course, that we can see that the <clears throat> plenum air is mixed with the room uh, air inside the plenum, actually. And we have a ventilation effectiveness of around 1. We have a very low turbulence intensity, around 15 to 25%, depending on the season. The draft rate is most of the time below the 5 percentages. And we can also see the measurement actually illustrates that the air temperature difference between the head and the angles is actually uh, lower than one degree Celsius. So, of course, this was a, a case or a school study was done, of course, before. We have these findings from uh, Olbo University, so of course there could have been some improvements. One of the improvements could have been that we could have actually have a large free area uh, in the facade. So we, sh we showed that there was some 6.5 centimeters gap in the in the facade where the air should enter into the plenum. It should or could actually also be higher. Actually, also the capacity of the exhaust is around, in this case, is around 750 cubic meter per hour, which is just perhaps a little bit too too small. It should perhaps have been around 1,000 cubic meter per hour in this case. So, of course, there are also some improvements and learnings to this. The next one I just want to briefly uh, tell you more about is just this hotel, uh, Kolling Fjord, also in Denmark. So you can see here, they have also used the diffuse ceiling, actually also in this very high room space. And it's actually a, a conference room. Uh, where they use this diffuse ceiling, and you can actually see here in the back of the room they have the exhaust. Uh, so this means that it is actually the same as the classroom I just showed you. So here the diffuse ceiling is done by a mechanical ventilation system above, and then the exhaust is carried out down here. So actually it could be a quite interesting also to see the risk of draft here. Uh, it could be fun or at least very uh, good case to actually to see how the diffuse ceiling is actually doing in this high ceiling space as well. Next one is Vestas, the office spaces and the canteen. Again here on your left hand side, this is showed uh, the office spaces is quite traditional. So you can see here, again we have the diffuse ceiling where the supply is done by a mechanical ventilation system and the exhaust is carried out uh, in the wall. In the canteen as well is a double high room space. So here again we have the fuse ceiling supply, just to give you some more examples. I have one more here. So this is actually a historical building. So this is from the outside. So it's Moscow Museum uh, University. So actually the museum is, you can see that in the background here. 
and these are some very old buildings. So actually, the, one of the challenges here was uh, the technical installations, because there are some, I can say, limits you have in these buildings. You cannot just tear down a wall or uh, do something in the roof. You have to be very careful through these kind of installations. So that was one of the reasons why they actually also chose this diffuse ceiling supply. Or there are both the students' room and workspaces and other areas here, as you can see. And the principle is actually just the same. We have these very uh, uh, plates here, actually, which has a low uh, pressure drop across these plates, around 2 pascal. So it's quite nice. The final one I want to show you is uh, one school again where I've been done a quite a lot of measurements and it's always quite interesting to see the measurements. So this was actually uh, Vandenberg School, is it called? So it's two classroom uh, that actually was selected to have this uh, diffuse ceiling uh, supply and then they want to show to the rest of the, to the rest of the school how these two classroom actually managed uh, throughout the test period. Uh, and actually, there's a paper of this done by the Technical University of Denmark, which has performed these uh, analyses. So there should be a paper available from the AEVC conference from 2012 if you have more interest uh, to read about this. So just very briefly about the installation. So sorry this is in Danish, but I think it's just a sketch just to illustrate the principle. So here we have actually, uh, yeah, you can see over here, there was a mechanical ventilation unit installed in the roof, which is shown here. One of them, the inlet is going to the plenum, the exhaust uh, is actually going to the, into the space itself, as shown here. Yeah, on the other side, you can see how the, the installation is actually done. So here we have the inlet and the roof and then the plates active and active plates here is actually uh, mounted screw mount to the ceiling. So as I showed you before, we have actually the planum here and then in, on this uh, axis or this, uh, yeah, this location we have, as you can see here, the exhaust. So again the pressure drop is across the ceiling is around 2 pascal. The plenum height uh, is actually 20 centimeters, which is actually the minimum planum height, uh, as uh, Pierre also explained. And then we have a 10% ceiling perforation, meaning that we have active boards, and that's what I want to show you here. Active boards is actually those in greens. So actually, there was a, yeah, a little challenge here for some of the guys who screw this. This, yeah, you can say screw this uh, ceiling up. You are not aware of that there was some of the boards which was actually active and some of them which was not active. So actually the design guide was to have these green boards as active plates and all of the rest of them which was not should not have been active. But actually uh, when they have screwed this uh, board off, it actually showed that, the, um, that yeah, they installed the active boards here marked in red, so it was not 100% ideal. But again, the, the test went went on. So uh, yeah, there was some different tests. Uh, sorry, it's perhaps a little bit uh, difficult for you to read, but I will just mention them. There was four tests here. So test scenario one and two was done with a 500 cubic meter per hour uh, as inlet and uh, with a supply temperature of 10 and 17 degrees Celsius. Scenario 3 and 4 was actually carried out with a, a higher supply flow rate of 1,000 cubic meter per hour, again with the same supply temperature of uh, 10 and 17 degrees. And here is just um, where the measurement has been carried out. So measurement 1 is here, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, and so on. It's carried out particular spaces or areas in the classrooms. And that's what I want to show you here. So this is actually measurements done with a supply uh, 
air temperature of 10 degrees and down here you can see the different measurement point uh, from 1 to 8 different stations uh, and up here on the horizontal axis we have the mean air velocity so the threshold value should be around the uh, 0.15 meters per second and we can actually see that most of the areas fulfill this uh, requirements is actually smaller it's actually around 0.1 or smaller but we can see that this measurement 0.3 there is some very very high higher air, mean air velocities and also at this uh, 0.7 so actually it's, it's it was shown later on that at this 0.3 there was it was located very close to a leaky hatch so that was why there was some problems in this area and also uh, this point uh, seven was actually located uh, in the close in the corner where there was some active panels one in the corner and one that was just located very close to it so this was also why there was it was actually over here so this was actually why there was some higher air velocities in this area and for the the point, point here, the point three. Uh, I can take this question. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually mean air velocity is. I think it's weighted uh, three minutes intervals over time. So again, here is just the supply air temperature. The results for the 17 degrees is actually shown precisely the same as for the supply air temperature of 10 degrees. Let's go a little bit further here. We can see some uh, thermovision photos. So actually, here we can see the active boards. Uh, here, you can see it's a little bit darker. So the active panels, the boards are also here. And actually here, you can see the leaky hatch, which is actually located here. And that was <coughs> where we have this point three that was located just below that. And that was the explanation why we got some high uh, velocity uh, measurements in this area. Um, so we can actually see that this is for the thermovision photos is actually for the 10, uh, Kel or 10 uh, Celsius supply uh, temperature and it was actually found that it was quite uh, well distributed areas and we can also see that the, that the panels was actually preheated to around uh, 14 degrees. Furthermore there was some smoke tests done uh, in this this classroom which actually showed a very uniform air distribution with very low air velocities and hereby also no draft risk and also the student did some questionnaires where they found out that there was no discomfort and it was actually much fresher out of it. Actually there was also a look at the life cycle cost of this uh, solution so compared of course to a mechanical traditional mechanical ventilation system so it was around in this area so it's, yeah, it's in Danish crowns just to give you some indication the diffuse ceiling is actually around this area so it's actually below the traditional mechanical ventilation system of course if we try to include the new ceiling of course the, the price would go up and that's of course uh, in a classroom actually uh, we almost should always have some kind of ceiling which can absorb the, the noise inside a room in order to comply with Danish building standards. So that's why we, we took this. Uh, so, and actually, we can also see that the energy consumption can actually be reduced with 50% in this case compared to a traditional uh, mechanical ventilation system. Of course, there is less dock work and so on. It's diffuse ceiling. It's, uh, yeah, there was also some tests done uh, in, for the classroom. Um, so it's actually showed that with diffuse seating, there was small tendency. There was increased speed for the student with 4%, not so much. But again, there was uh, actually shown that there was 10% more correct answers in the math tests uh, compared, to a, uh, compared to a classroom without diffuse seating. 
also with for the Danish uh, language test that was done, there was actually 15% fewer uh, mistakes by the students with the classroom with the pure ceiling. So again, very nice results as well. So again, what have we learned from this case study? We have learned that actually the main findings that was no uh, risk of graft. Um, both in case of the high and low air flow rates. There was a uniform air uh, distribution, temperature distribution throughout the room. And it was actually almost perfectly mixed uh, throughout the space as well. Of course, what have couldn't be improved in this case what of course was the leaky hatch, which actually interfered with the results. And also the active panels, which was not uh, correctly installed. That could also have been uh, done in other ways, and especially the one in the corner should be try to be a least. Lastly, uh, I'll just briefly mention that this diffuse ceiling, as Pia also mentioned, there are several solutions. It can be natural, it can be mechanical, it can also be a combination, which we have shown here, which is hybrid ventilation, so there are many, many different possibilities. Uh, just for your record, uh, this webinar is recorded uh, as well. So it will be, yeah, you can find the recording in a couple of days on this homepage, uh, windowmaster.com slash webinars. And you can also find here, for instance, uh, webinars, which Pierre also have done earlier uh, about ventilative cooling and other things as well. Uh, and uh, I will also send the presentation to you all as being today. Yes, so now we can let the fire begin. So the questions, I can see there has been a lot of questions throughout the, uh, the webinar here. I will just try to start from one end and go through them all. Uh, yeah, firstly we have here Asker, uh, who there was a question to you, Pierre, if you are there. Yes. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, you actually showed a figure with these different diffusers uh, where you actually showed uh, the temperature difference compared to the how much flow rate there was into into these diffusers and he was uh, or he asked uh, what is the the unit of this q0 I'm not sure if you know that by heart Um, yes, I think this is uh, liters per second. It is it is liters per second. No, no cubic okay, meters. No, no, it's cubic meters per second. Um, it's cubic meter per second. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, perfect. That's one of them. And we go to the next one with the presentation bill available afterwards. Yes, it will. Then uh, Thomas also wrote something. If we will cover uh, fire issues with the diffuse ceiling solution, and yeah, we have not covered that here. I'm not sure if you have some information about that. Um, Pierre, have you come across this? Uh, no, it, it, it's clear that uh, if you need, uh, you could say, if, if you have a mechanical system, then you have the air supply to the room. And yeah. of course, there you need to have the fire uh, protection as you would in any a mechanical system supply, supplying air to the to the room. So I don't think uh, a diffuse ceiling is not any different from another air supply, except that instead of having uh, 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 pipes and, and devices in the space, you, you provide the air directly to the plenum and then have the supply to the space. OK, yeah. Uh, next question was, yeah, we are still a little bit up here. So next question was from Louis. Uh, how do you calculate graft risk? I think perhaps we have covered that a little bit. So you can either do that by measuring the, uh, the air velocity in the space. Uh, we have used the, the the equation that you can find in the uh, in the standards. I think it's 7730. Yep. Uh, and and uh, in calculating the graft risk, you take uh, uh, you take into consideration the the uh, air temperature. The air velocity and the turbulence level in the in the air. Yeah, exactly. And that was also the the slide I show you where we done some measurements and calculation of the graph risk as well. Uh, catch me right that uh, he's not able to find the guideline on the website. Uh, 
yeah, yes. I think it, it, it is on the website, and uh, the the challenge is that the search engine uh, on the website is not as good as Google's. Um, so, so this means that when you type the uh, the title of the of the guide, and then you press on publications, then you may have to go 10, 15 publications down before you find the right one. Okay. So, Otherwise, so uh, it's a little bit tricky. But uh, the, 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 there is a direct link to the publication, but it's quite long and not very understandable. So that's not a good alternative either. OK, otherwise, I, I suggest that we can uh, either, I will send out a link with this. Uh, yeah, I think that's better. Yeah, and then I can uh, give you a link to that one. And uh, Klaus Nielsen also wrote, uh, how do you? Uh, do heat recovery. So I was, let's see here, of course, in an, a normal mechanical ventilation system, it's of course obviously, but uh, in the in the one uh, school I show you, where there was just inlet with a natural ventilation and then an exhaust in the back of the room, there was obviously no, uh, you can say, heat recovery for the type of system. Let's see here. I think you should do a calculation or uh, to estimate what is the need for heat recovery. And of course, if you have a strong need for heat recovery, uh, uh, then you should establish a system for heat recovery. If if you don't have a strong need for heat recovery because you have a, a large cooling need in the space you are ventilating, uh, th then there is no reason to, to establish heat recovery. Exactly. We have we have to remember that heat recovery also costs electric energy. So when you look at the total balance, it might not be uh, if you have a, 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 a room with a high cooling need during occupation, uh, then it might not be beneficial to establish heat recovery at all. Exactly. Okay. So Christian here has a question as well: Which pressures should be supplied on the plenum side uh, on the diffuse ceiling. We have some. Well, it, it depends on what pressure you want in the room. Uh, the, the, of course, the pressure in the plenum should be, you could say, a few per scale higher than the pressure in the room. So, it, so the pressure in the plenum depends on what pressure you want in the room. Yeah. Perhaps also what kind of diffuser plates yeah. you're using. So on. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have uh, Lewis. He writes here: Should the plenum or does the plenum ceiling need to be cleaned regularly as the incoming air is traveling through it? I have no good answer to that because I don't have any experience in in uh, how often it's necessary. Okay, and actually, in in those cases with, uh, where you just have an inlet without a filter, of course you could integrate a core filter, or or you can use it only. Talk discussed about that. You can use the plenum only in the winter time, and then you can use uh, natural ventilation in the summer time as well. So there are different solutions to that as well. Then Klaus asks, uh, what is your experience with the canteen and conference room? Uh, of course, the light, uh, large room heights. Did you have any measurements? Uh, and of course, Pierre showed that it was not recommended to, to have this diffuse ceiling uh, on large room heights. Actually, we have not done any. No, I will not say it's not recommended. I, I will just say that the cooling capacity is much lower when you have a, a high room height than if you have a, a, a low room height. Okay, I think what what his Klaus is thinking yeah. about is actually the the CFD calculation that show that you could have increased air speeds or air velocity around the occupant. Yes, you have a higher uh, risk at the at the same heat load. You have a higher risk of draft when you have a high room height. So, but this mean this just means that the capacity, the maximum capacity of the ceiling is lower when you have a a, a high room height. Uh, okay. So uh, I think for the for the low room height, we, we have seen cooling cooling capacities of maybe 70, 80 watts per square meter. 
if you have a large room height, it, it may decrease maybe to 30, 40 watts per square meter. So you okay. can still use the system, but the capacity is lower. Okay, yeah, yeah, that gives a good explanation as well. Okay, so <clears throat> Oscar asked if we have any uh, examples with mineral wool, and I couldn't. No, I think if we use mineral wool, it of course needs to be sealed. So, so it needs to be sealed in the edges and and uh, in, in in the surfaces where it, which is exposed to the air. So we don't have any release of fibers, and it's of course important that choose uh, to choose a product that is properly sealed. Okay, uh, and then uh, ask uh, ask if uh, is the system suitable for production kitchens? So uh, yeah, there have been some. Not problems, but issues here. I I don't know the answer to that question. So, oh, I have no suggestions. Okay, I think actually we got through the most of the questions along the way. Of course, you are always welcome to uh, to let's go forward here. Yeah, here's my mail address. So, of course, if you have any further questions, you can write to me, uh, and I will try to address these uh, questions on. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I will say thanks to uh, Peer for presenting this very, very interesting field and also a little bit new field uh, about this diffuse seeding supply. Um, and hopefully, all of you got some insights uh, and can use this in the in the future. And uh, I will send out the presentation uh, we have done today, and also the a link to the to where you can find uh, the, the design guide, as uh, Pierre actually also mentioned uh, throughout this presentation. But otherwise, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, thank you again, Pierre, for participating and giving a, a nice lecture in this diffuse ceiling supply. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, I think, yeah. Time is actually just three o'clock, so that was perfect time. So uh, I will say thank you, and uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye bye.